Okay. There's so much I want to talk about, and it's all a mess. Today's video will be a boots on the ground. I took the drone in a little closer to that anomalous site in Provo, Utah. I'd like to talk about the mysterious orb that eclipsed the sun the other day. Why it doesn't move in the same direction as the moon. No, instead it just follows some abnormal path coming in from the bottom. Not even coming in the right way. The moon should move from east to west, similar to the sun. In my opinion, it is certainly another object. But for today, I thank you for being here. I love you all. God bless and welcome. so much I want to share. It's stupid. Right away, I'm having issues with my computer, and maybe I should just walk away. But it is time, and I believe that there's 10,000 ways to do something. What I thought was the good way is not possible now. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you didn't watch the video where I shared this discovery, here it is. Wow, that escalated really quickly. We're just jumping into it. It was right around the time of this great winter storm that I think passed through most of the country. I was certain that my drone would be blown into the cliff wall or the building, but I flew as much as I could. I thought it was worth losing a drone. The footage, at least a poor copy of it, would be saved to my phone. But in the end, it was a success. I'm really amazed how you don't notice this section, even in person. Certainly with a phone camera, you don't notice it. I have a zoom lens, but it only goes up to 250. A 400 would be a lot better. But I think the drone did a pretty good job of getting us even closer, really looking like a building buckling, and we can even see the detail of these structures on the right side. Again, from afar, they look so new and polished. And here we get in a little closer, and we can see supports here, and a fine, fine line between constructed and what we would be told is natural. Really blurring these lines. It seems like this exploration now is going on for two weeks. This particular day, Chief and I were all over the place. I tried to approach this from every angle, even from the top up here. I'll show you some footage, hopefully, of our exploration on the backside. According to Google Maps, I could get right up to this thing from the backside. And what I realized is exactly what it looks like, a sheer drop-off. So then I tried to approach it from this road, this beautiful construction here, and soon discovered there was no visiting this site. I hope to show you some of the pictures I took, but in short, this is owned by the U.S. government. Let me try to pull up something to show you here. Here we go. This is the backside, and this would have been the easier way to go up, but they didn't want us to go up this way. U.S. government property, no trespassing, closed to the public. And then a little snitch number. $25,000 reward for snitching. And unlike the other place I went hiking, the lime kilns, where everybody was really nice. People were very suspicious <laughs> up here, probably because of all these signs. So I minded the sign. There was another sign right here, and it said you need to go this way, the difficult way, out of the way. So we did. Here you can see that sign. Again, very mean sign. Stay on the trail. The adjacent land is private. No 
unauthorized usage, risk of prosecution, and then again a number. And we went way up here. Later I approached it from the other side, closer to the ruins, and I discovered this big tank and they had fenced off the whole mountain. So this would have again been the easy way to approach the structure. Here we can see how beautiful it is. And there's a park down here, and this is a shooting range. Very noisy, and perhaps they just have snipers stationed here. And as always, the animals give me signs, and this bird told me I was in the right place, but there was really nothing I could do about it. Here you can even see the perfect road that I would normally follow to the left, but it wasn't happening. Here you can see one of the roads, and perhaps an old ruined one below it, and another sign the cherry blossoms on this tree right here. Always something I run into. They must cook down to the roots and then spring back up again. So let me just fill you in on my discoveries. This place here, ultimately we would be told, is part of this old early 1900s Olmsted hydroelectric plant. One of the first in the country, we're told Tesla had his hand in this plant. And they even had a school. Old, old world buildings down here. I'll show you some of those. But regardless, they turned it into a school. A hydroelectric energy school for a short time. Westinghouse had his hand in this. And really an amazing and ridiculous story just like all the old narratives trying to explain away these ruins. So here you can actually see the paths that I took. The ruins that I'm trying to get to are about here. Here we go. There. You can see the road that I wish I was allowed to take, but no. I only was allowed to go this far to this reservoir, and then it was all fenced off. Fence, 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 and then super fence. I suppose I could have gone around the fence now that I'm looking at it, but there were signs. I'm not sure. This is certainly not over. This would have led me right to this tunnel, essentially. Here, this is that road, and I call it a tunnel because it looks like it used to go through this mountain, or this mountain was all structure. And then again, we hiked this back trail here. You could see the nice one that they wouldn't let us go on, the nice road. And then there was the rough trail right here, zigzagging, which eventually took us to the road that they didn't want us to be on. So it tells me they didn't want us to see this area. They did not want us walking along this road and discovering these ruins that I showed in a past video. And this may be that tunnel. This is the backside of the tunnel. You can see it here. Perhaps they filled it in to some extent. And essentially it takes us through the mountain back to this point. And really there's no talk of this point. I've done a lot of research and there's just no talk of this point. This is just obscure. As far as the ruins go, they do talk about this pipeline. And we can see that pipeline poking up somewhere over here. They call it the Union Aqueduct. And here it is, a little piece of it, I don't know why, pops out here and then goes back into the ground and no doubt ties into this point. Fills up this reserve as I read about. But here, I mean, this is my point of interest. Why? Absolutely fascinating. And here's what it looks like again. Clearly it has collapsed. And here's what we see. So we're not seeing the other side of the tunnel, but we do see these supports. We do see this clearly artificial wall fusing in with the mountain here. And this is as close as I got. From this, I've taken a lot of stills and zoomed in even closer digitally. So the Olmsted Station Powerhouse, Provo, Utah, built in 1904, the plant provided 12 megawatts of power, which is enough for 3,000 homes. Along with the power station, these men established an institute known as the Telluride Institute, home to 40 students. It was the first corporate-sponsored electrical school in the U.S. 
and continued to operate until 1912 when Utah Power and Light Company obtained the property. And this is really interesting. As it turns out, I'll just fast forward, the U.S. government came in and took it over under the Utah Power and Water, some kind of acronym, but essentially owned by the federal government today. History. In order to harvest the power of the falling water, new technology needed to be invented. The Nunn brothers, the guys who built this, provided Westinghouse with a pouch of gold. And Westinghouse came through, we're told. In other articles, we're told about Tesla, of course, because it would have to have been Tesla. There's no Westinghouse without mentioning Tesla. Westinghouse is the money, and Tesla is the brains, according to the narrative. A lot of the original equipment is in there, and I do plan on taking a tour. If we look at the photos provided by Google Earth, we can see some of that machinery in there still. Large turbines. Here we can see brick structures going into the mountain. Here would have been that school, and here the power plant, and we see more power plants up there, which is now seemingly gone, this part. The power plant has been decommissioned and moved somewhere. Here again, we can see that building with the arches that seem like they had another purpose initially, and now decommissioned. Here again, a closer look at the brick. We see everything goes underground, and it's all about underground at this site. These pipelines, I mean, that's what we're really talking about here. Burying pipelines in the late 1800s, early 1900s, People coming out to Provo, Utah, not even Salt Lake City. Here we can see a modern crane. And we see the riverbanks here. Just old blockage canals, essentially. All the rivers are not natural rivers. Here is a plaque on one of the motors, one of the turbines. And how interesting with these dates, how they don't have an 18. I mean, we're to assume September 5th. 1893, here 1888, all the different patents. Very interesting, because I was doing research in a past video on the Roosevelt Dam and all the anomalies that could be seen here, such as this section right here, turning into mountain, building and mountain fusion, again built in this early time period, all these old world buildings, really looking Starfort-like down here. And I think these walls will be interesting to examine in person, going all the way down to the water. But here I thought to myself, bastards, this is really acting up, sorry. I thought to myself, what else? could be found down here. And I zoom in to this bridge just above the dam. Look how they're messing with me today. And I thought, God, there's got to be ruins everywhere. So I zoomed in under the bridge, and this is what I discovered. And let's draw the man they let us. It's kind of being psycho right now. Man, man, man. Dropping. And here we go. They don't want to show it to us today, but you can see it. You can see it right there. There we go. Just hidden away. Two tiers, three tiers. Beautiful blockage fusing into mountain. Right here, right off of this highway. Just up the river from the dam. And there we can see the dam. There she is. And here, ruins. Super cool. Perhaps they're working on scrubbing it as we speak. But I'm glad I got to share it with you right now. So really not much info on this Olmsted power station. There is, but it's scattered all over the place. Here we can see the inside of one of the old pipes. It looks like they've laid carpet in here for a tour. <laughs> here we can see some older pictures. And essentially the site, fully built out with trees and canals, old world buildings, is now just a historical tour site since 2015. Reading the story, it's like everything just went backwards and eventually is seized by the federal government. But this is the gold for me. This shot right here is what I came for, and it was a success. Unbelievable. So much to explore here. I mean, there's the hokey story, which I didn't get into much. And it's probably because I wasn't satisfied. There's no explanation for this right here. 
This is what I want a story for. Okay, I know that it's all going to be part of these two brothers in the early 1900s. I know it was eventually seized by the government, but this is what I'm interested in. And this is what I want to see pictures of them building. And there's just no mention of these little anomalies. So the next time I go, I'm going to fly the drone up here to the right and try to get a peek into this tunnel. Perhaps fly the drone right up to this window, maybe even in it a little. It looks like it was once some kind of a spillway. Again, it was so windy on this day. Storm was rolling in, snowing on and off. Good in one way. Kind of scares most people off. But again, I was concerned that I would crash my drone. But sure enough, even the zoom lens did not permit me this point of view. Again, I thought this building up here on the right was newer. Like, really new. And it appears to consist of old blocks. Again, such a fine line between natural and man-made. So this quest is really interesting. It wasn't at all what I was expecting, but now everything seems to be pointing to these dams, these hydroelectric dams. And I really got carried away in my thoughts and started seeing the big picture. How these dams may have played a large role, not only for the past civilization, who clearly utilized and harnessed, canaled and channeled nature, but also perhaps the destruction of the old world. If all these major cities had been built out by a past civilization, they all had these giant water reservoirs in place, utilizing and spinning the waters. And these may have been the reason for what we call the mud flood, or just the cataclysm that wiped out a lot of these cities. If all of this infrastructure failed, it would render all of these cities to, again, what we call a mud flood, burying at least a floor. And in my opinion, no doubt, this is older than these two brothers making water aqueducts through mountains. The first? Just the first is how you get going? Nothing a little simpler before tackling this one? No. Such a success, they create a school. First corporate Westinghouse funded school. Essentially reverse engineering school. And there were two examples of towns I wanted to share today. And I don't think I'm going to get to them. But one was called Haver, Montana. I watched a video on YouTube. And the man was telling the story like it is. The whole city burned and they discovered that the underground, the brick underground, was still intact. And this is mainstream narrative. So everybody moved underground. And you had the underground Haver, Montana business district. Normal as could be. Everybody just moved underground. Disregarded the fire. Another thing I wanted to share with you today was the Lemp Brewery. Again, underground. Super, super underground brewery. Built in the 1800s. Hopefully we'll dive into that next week. So I don't know. Again, I would love to share all of the details I discovered, but I also want to keep things short and to the point. It is an ongoing exploration. I also discovered a little Swiss village called Midway. It's kind of out of Heber, Utah. And this place up in the mountains had the most amazing stone and brickwork everywhere and had been turned into a little Swiss village. A Swiss facading, basically. And I was absolutely in love with this little town and can't believe I never came up here. Here you can see some of the brick cottages and a really old, old area. I should have filmed a lot more, but my purpose for being up here it was kind of a selfish one. It was said to have a wonderful bakery, even higher up than this little downtown. A resort called Zermatt, I think. And it was amazing. They did not let me down. It was a legit bakery. French style bakery. Essentially, I was in search of a good croissant. And when I got in, they had one. Just half hour before closing on a Sunday. And I was able to secure 
not only a beautiful croissant, but a small artichoke and sun-dried tomato quiche, a beautiful baguette, and a couple sweet things. A little apple strudel. <laughs> and it really was ridiculous. I had a great time. I finally went to the Cracker Barrel. Again, I stayed the night there. And I ate wonderful breakfast, a large, eggy style breakfast. It's really strange. I feel like I hadn't eaten in years. I went to downtown Provo the next day and walked around downtown. Here we can see a beautiful building. I don't even know what it is. No signage. And that's kind of how Provo is and has always been in my 30 years of Utah. And I'm actually heading to an Indian restaurant right behind me. I got some paneer masala and garlic naan. It was really good, but the best is Bombay House in Salt Lake. But this place was good too. So for this week, I thank you all for joining me. I love you all. God bless, and I'll see you soon.